from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Yes, I am Sven Erlinson, the host of the Badass Counseling Show, and you have found us for another episode of Lightning Round, taking listener questions, whether you are checking in from Prince Edward Island or Georgia or War Road, Minnesota, all the way up to Alberta, Canada, and out to New Zealand. We've got folks in from all around the world. Belgium, great to have you here. And I'm joined in studio by KC over in the booth, as per usual, and Rob the Rocket sitting next to me. Rob, how are you today, young man? I'm good. You know how I always say before we start, make sure your phone's on Do Not Disturb. Yeah. And I so I, I forgot myself today, which is why we were hearing an echo while getting set up, which <laughs> all goes to show nobody's perfect. But you're as close as they come, Rob. I don't think so. I think so. So we are taking questions here, and it's great to have you here with us. Thank you, everyone, for checking in. I've got the first question right here. Karen's firing it right at us today. Uh, Karen says, Sven, I've read your book. Why do I feel empty and lost now? Um, a couple of things. You're not the only one that that happens to. Uh, one of the things I tell people is when you're doing work on self, what you're going to experience is going to, there's going to be lightness. You're going to begin to have spontaneous energy. As you're getting this stuff more and more out of you, you're less burdened by life. And you it's literally, it's not a woo-woo fucking kumbaya shit. You literally feel physically different when the more you go in and do this work. However, what precedes all the good feelings is the heavy feelings of realizing all that you're seeing. When you go inside and explore all the origins of your pain and begin to do the work of getting out, you're going to become exposed to, holy crap, this is what's been going on the whole time. And that can be overwhelming, can be depressing, and so on and so forth. Well, you, if you're going to release feelings and memories and so forth, you actually have to remember and feel the feelings and memories. And so it's bringing those up. And so when you stir all of that up, with whether it's with the book or in counseling with your own therapist or in your own journaling life, it gets stirred up and you're feeling it and you feel very down. And then the second piece is this. So that's the first piece. You say you've read the book and now you're feeling uh, uh, empty and lost now. But it also requires staying in the disciplines, continuing to do the work of digging deeper. And furthermore, I guarantee you, if you're still feeling lost and alone, that there's something even deeper that wasn't, that you weren't able to get to um, in the book. I would actually recommend going back through it, but I also have other books, resources there listed in the front of my book by other authors. Um, because sometimes, you know, we just can't get everything from one book. I'd love to say that I cure every ailment, but I, alas, I don't. And so there's some really good ones there at the beginning of the book. Um, and uh, if you're looking for one in particular that you want to go to next on that list, you might want to look into the last one in the list. Um, in those you have the book, that's code for look at the last one. That's a good one to go to next. There are actually a few there. I actually recommend also uh, Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain up there, number two. But um, again, you've stirred up some stuff. You got to continue those disciplines, the journaling, the letter writing, going deeper, more self-help work because there's more in there. But once you begin to get that out more and more, you will feel it. You will know. All right. Next question. How do you deal with an extreme taker using our kids as a weapon to get what she wants? You stand strong. Because once you start giving in, they will take even more. And that's the one of the lessons we learned from Neville Chamberlain, right? Before uh, Britain entered World War II, he comes back with what's known as the famous piece of paper and where he had gone over and talked to Hitler and got Hitler to sign a no invasion agreement. And he gets off his plane and he waves that famous piece of paper. And in fact, that's all it was. Hitler invaded not too much longer later. And so that's what happens when you give in to a bully. And sometimes you just have to stand strong. You have a strong lawyer, you use the courts, but unfortunately, the courts aren't going to step in every time your uh, ex, your extreme taker ex, disparages you to the kids, tries to drive a wedge between you and your kids, et cetera. And you just have to keep standing strong, minimize contact if possible. Um, you're still gonna have to have contact regarding you know, the kids and so forth. Um, and like I said, good lawyer as well but you deal with it. And then on top of it, nothing is going to drive you through the, the ceiling more and drive you nuts more than all the stuff inside of you. 
And you have to be deliberate, especially when you're interacting in an extreme situation, such as this with an extreme taker. You have to be constantly flushing out your own emotion because nothing causes us to make bad decisions or flustered decisions or angry decisions more than having a whole bunch of emotions stirred up inside of us. So you've got to get all that crap out so that you're making clearer decisions. Next question. Okay, here we go. This is good. In that same sort of theme, Melissa says, why can't I believe the actions of my taker, but I listen to his words. He is so draining. I did a video on this uh, right when I was first getting on TikTok. It was summer of 21. And I, I <laughs> mentioned sort of the fallacy that people say, well, actions speak louder than words. It's actually a fallacy. I believe that Words speak far louder than actions. And you want to know why I say that? Because we actually have to have a saying to tell people that actions speak louder than words. In other words, what that means is we are very, 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 very inclined to listen to people's words. Now, I understand the sentiment of, you know, action speaks louder than words. What it's really saying is don't listen to their words, listen to their actions. But we, it, but the words are such a powerful draw that we, somebody actually had to come up with a saying to make you not listen to the words. Words are powerful, and they're powerful in part because it's what we want to hear. And an extreme taker will tell you every fucking thing that you want to hear. Why? Because they want to keep you there. They want you to stay. They don't want you to leave. They want you to stay and keep pouring love into their love cup. That's what they want. And they will lie. And furthermore, so it's always wants and fears. You ask, well, basically, why do I keep listening to a liar? And it's funny because I just put up a post this morning. A, it's you want something and B, you're afraid of something. Remember, folks, and those of you that have read the book, there's a hole in my love cup. Remember, if you're ever trying to understand why someone is doing something that doesn't make sense, always ask yourself the question, what is the primary fear driving the behavior? Speculate the answers. R literally write that fucking question on a piece of paper. What is the fear driving my behavior that's causing me, in this case, to keep listening to an extreme taker, even though they keep fucking hurting me? What is my fear? And, and you can say, well, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that, but be more deliberate about it. Jot out all the things that it might be and drill down and what is really your biggest fear in this situation. Because I guarantee if you are listening to someone against your own best interest, as you just acknowledge in your question, why can't I believe the actions of my taker and listen to his words? He is so draining, okay? There is a fear driving your behavior. Fear causing you to hold on and hold on and hold on. I guarantee it's, I'll list five, let's say, Fear of being alone, if you were to actually walk away and to look at the actions, recognize it is a pattern that's not going to change and walk away. Fear of being alone. Fear of all the voices inside of you that rise up when you're alone. That's what aloneness really is. Oh, see, I'm a loser. Nobody wants me. See, I'm unlovable. They walked away. And that's why we hold on to crappy love. Why? Because as long as someone is here, they're a counter message to all the other messages inside of me that say, I suck. I'm unwantable. I'm unlovable. I don't matter. All right. Uh, fear of what someone's going to think. And in everybody's life, there's someone who's powerful, someone whose voice we, at least to some degree, either still hear in our head, even though they may be long dead, or whose wrath we fear, criticism we fear. And so it's quite possible you're staying in this relationship because you're afraid of somebody else's voice. Now, maybe it's your extreme taker's voice, but very often it's the voice of a parent saying, oh, you can't leave your marriage. Oh, see, look at you. Couldn't stay married. What's wrong with you? Whatever. Very, most often in life, not always, I shouldn't say always, but there's someone in our life whose criticism we fear. And if you have children, the idea of walking away from your extreme taker is indicates you, A, may not want to hurt the children, but it may be their voice you're afraid of, their criticism or fear that they won't like you or fear that it might hurt them. It will, but they'll get over it if they have therapy and a company of people around them. So there, I've just rattled off five or six different potential reasons of things you're afraid of. Or, or the other one is, and this is a really good extreme taker. If you ever want to meet a real fucking pro of an extreme taker, meet the one that isn't just harsh on you and everything, but when you when you consider leaving or when you're fighting or one of the themes in the in the relationship is, but I need you, I need you, I need you. Where they actually just come right out and say, I need you. And then when you're not doing what they want, then they're dicks. It's just like, because if you're an extreme giver, the folks that often find themselves in a relationship with extreme takers, someone saying, I need you is like fucking catnip on crack. It's just like, oh, somebody needs me. Oh, I can't leave, right? We've all been there. 
I mean, at least the extreme givers have. Um, so there's any number of reasons, but I guarantee you keep listening to the words, A, because you want it to work. You want this person, oh, the good times are so good, but the good times are like one half of one teaspoonful, and the bad times are like five quarts, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't call them an extreme taker. So it's, it's you're wanting something, and you have extreme fear. Rob, do you have a question for me? I do indeed, Sven. This is from Tesha. All right, Tesha. And she says... My boyfriend bought me fake flowers, as he assumes every weekend I cheat on him. But I'm with my daughters. I was upset about it. I told him. He said, I'm an ungrateful bitch. It's so annoying trying. Wait, I, the piece I don't get in that. I, I, first of all, you, I lost it at the fake flowers. That's just great. Good okay. for you. Okay, so he buys me fake flowers because yeah. he thinks I'm cheating on him? Yeah, but she's actually, she says she's with, with her, the kids. With her daughters, yeah. So if I buy you flowers, that will hopefully solve the cheating equation. And they're fake. Well, no, I got the fake part. I was I was sort of um, holding off the orgasm a bit before I got to go after that one. Okay. I just wanted to get the, the the sort of foreplay right. So he's buying flowers. I think you're cheating on me, but I am convinced if I buy you flowers, you'll stop. Probably. Okay. All right. Hey, A for effort or that, something that for works, effort. works, doesn't it? D minus for effort, but okay. But the fake flowers. All right. I'll, okay. I'll just put it out there. If he's cheap enough that he's buying fucking fake flowers, then- Really, the fact that he's buying flowers at all is actually somewhat impressive. <laughs> but fake flowers, i it's just, there's always new stuff. Just when you think you heard it all. Oh, God bless him. Um, but then he called you an ungrateful bitch for not liking your fake flowers. That's what he said. Ah. Well, that's not okay. Now, the truth is, if we're being really honest, if we're all being our level-headed, honest selves, I have called a woman a bitch before in a conversation. I have been called a piece of shit or a dick or you have a small penis. Or I've been insulted in every way possible, okay? And if you push me far enough, I have an acerbic tongue, okay? Um, so on one hand, if it's a one-off, if this is the first time he's ever called you something bad, I think there's some room for um, you know discussion about it at the very least. It's not okay. I'm not saying it's okay. But if it's a one-off, that's one thing. But I'm willing to bet that it's not. It's not. You don't indicate in there whether you are cheating at all. You simply say you're not cheating in the times when uh, he thinks you're cheating. Now, I'm going to assume that you're not cheating at all. Uh, I'm going to assume that. Uh, and so you've got someone who's paranoid and... Um, you know, there's a funny little thing. I don't think I've ever described it on the show. One of the first sort of theories that I came up with when I was first starting my counseling practice, I remember um, I was back in my 30s. I had already been counseling as a pastoral counselor, but I was sort of beginning my practice, my late 20s actually. And I call it the beautiful spouse syndrome. Now it doesn't have to be beauty per se, but let's say I'm a guy and I am a guy, so this works well. Let's say I'm a guy and I have a spouse or a girlfriend who's just fucking hot as fuck, okay? I mean, and, um, or whatever, I consider her a catch, a real catch. And like, she's better than me or like, wow, any guy would love to have her. What a lot of people do, and this isn't just a guy doing it with a woman. I actually was in a long-term uh, relationship where the woman was doing it with me. Why she thought I was such a catch, who the fuck knows? But bottom line is she did. Clearly she had no taste. So anyway, what this guy will do is, he will begin to say, if there are certain people when they're in a situation and if they get jealous, if they get uncomfortable, here's what they start to do. And it very often happens with a guy who has a beautiful spouse or a beautiful girlfriend. He'll say things like, you know, I don't know why you spend time with your girlfriends going dancing, you know, once a month. It's just like, you know, you're in your 30s. So haven't you outgrown that yet? And over time, slowly but surely, you'll spend a little less time because what do you want? You want to make him happy, right? And then he'll say, you know, that guy, Ty, I mean, I know you've known him since kindergarten and you guys live next door to each other. And you're like, his parents were so good to you and everything. But really, is it really, why do you guys spend, you know, why do you guys see each other twice a year? I don't get that. It's just, you know, it's just kind of weird. You know, I, I am your boyfriend, you know. And so what will she do? She'll say, you know, Ty, um, let's just get together next Christmas as well, rather than in the summer as well. Or I have uh, I know someone very close to me who says that, you know, when she was dating her first boyfriend uh, after moving out of the house, that her first boyfriend 
didn't like her spending time with her family. Your family. And so she was spending less time and she would have to sneak over to her parents' house to spend time with her parents, all right? So what happens is, it's, and in that case, it wasn't just that he was afraid of his, her cheating with her parents, but really that's exactly what he was afraid of. He was afraid of her cheating him, giving attention to anyone other than him. So this guy in a situation, now I'm back to the original situation, the beautiful spouse syndrome, you begin to cut this person off, this beautiful spouse, or this person you consider a catch. You begin to cut them off from what? Slowly but surely from their love sources from their sources of energy, from their sources of life. You begin to want only her attention only for me because the fear is what? The fear is if she's giving it somewhere else, she may meet someone else, she may fall in love and she may leave me. Well, what happens is the more he cuts her off from Ty or going uh, dancing once a month with her girlfriends or spending time with her family, guess what happens to her? She's trying to make him happy. She thinks, well, this is a relationship and I'll just give more and I'll just give more and I wanna make him happy and so forth. What begins to happen to her is all of those things that were formerly love sources, pouring love into her love cup, giving her energy, life energy, are now withering on the vine because they're not being nurtured. Those times with girlfriends, she's not spending as much time with them. So she's not getting love, she's not getting energy, she's not getting life force poured into her. Less time with Ty, who is a very dear old friend, less time with her family. So she begins to wither on the vine. And she begins to feel empty. And she begins to feel unloved. And guess what often happens? She walks away. She walks away because she equates her unhappiness, her lack of life force, love not pouring into her, she, she equates that with him and she can't equate it with him because the truth is no one person is enough to fully fill another one person's love cup. And so she's going empty and she's not getting it from the, all the sources she used to get it. So she walks away. So he just created the very eventuality he most feared. He feared her leaving and he made it happen by cutting her off from her love sources. So back to the original question. The original question was, um, you know, you've got a jealous boyfriend. Basically, he, the question didn't say, the question said, you know, my boyfriend thinks I'm cheating and he bought me fake flowers, presumably to make me stop, but I'm not cheating. When I'm gone, I'm actually with my freaking kids, right? Though technically you could cheat with your kids, but I'm gonna, again, assume you're not cheating. And when I called him out on it, it's like fake flowers and he called me an ungrateful bitch. Okay. Kind of a dickish thing to do, very dickish thing to do. And if it's a pattern, uh, that's not okay. And that's not somebody you wanna be in a relationship with because that shit only metastasizes. But I was addressing the jealousy issue. Go ahead, Rob, you wanna say something? Yeah, there's another um, listener with a similar name calling uh, point. Why would my husband call me a slut and never apologize for it? Well, there are two answers to that. One is the ugly answer and you're not gonna like it. And the ugly answer is because he doesn't have to. Because you, we so expect people in life, and what I mean by that is there's no repercussions for him not doing so. So he says, fuck it, I'm not gonna fucking apologize to you, slut. Fuck you, all right? So that's, that's a heinous personality right there. That's just fucking vile. And you don't wanna be in a relationship with somebody like that, and it sucks to realize that and say that. But there's a second answer to that. Why doesn't he apologize? One, he doesn't have to. He's not being held accountable. Uh, but two, um, he, what well, I think he, no, he does know something's wrong because he's not uh, calling other people that, but he's, he continues to do it because he can get away with it and he keeps getting away with it. There's no pain point. There are no repercussions uh, for doing that, but you're really, you're expecting him to act the way you would act. You would apologize if you hurt someone's feelings. And one of the biggest mistakes we make in relationships is assuming that the other person will act the way I would act. And very often, and it's only a mistake if you begin to see that they're not doing it, yet you keep hoping and expecting them to act certain ways. I've seen marriages extend 10, even 20 years where one person is still expecting the other person to respond differently, to act differently, even though they have a 10 or 20 year pattern of acting this way. I still expect that they're gonna act better because I see glimpses or I know who, I'll just make up a name, I know who Tommy is. Back when we first started dating, he just was such a great guy and every now and then there are those glimpses and I know he's in there somewhere. Yeah, but he's never fucking coming out. All you're getting is dickhead. It's like you're dating dickhead and you don't want to accept that you are dating dickhead. 
and at some point, or married to dickhead, and at some point, dickhead becomes very, very hurtful, and you gotta walk away. And the truth is, he will change then, very often. He'll change, and he'll say, I've changed, and he'll stop calling you things like slut, your own wife. He'll stop calling you slut. And he'll say, I'll even go to therapy, and he'll say blah, 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 and what usually happens in that case is month, two months, three months later, he ain't doing it anymore. Why? He's got your back, he doesn't have to. Next question. You know what, though? Before we take the next question, we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back. I had a really good start in my life, and I've been successful in my career, but I have to say I've learned so much and improved my outlook on life since I met Sven and picked up a copy of Badass Wisdom. With the daily meditations as journaling prompts, I've uncovered a lot of memories that weren't totally pleasant. With Sven's guidance, I've achieved some new understanding, and honestly, I feel lighter. Badass Wisdom is a great read in nice small bites, and I think anyone can benefit from it. So go to badasscounseling.com and get the book or the audiobook. It could change your life. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. Good to have you back, badasses. I had a question. It was all queued up. It was right in front of me. And then it went zip, bang. Here we are over on TikTok for this one. This is Kay asking my partner to change. In response, empty promises or it's my personality. If you don't like it, leave. And Kay doesn't ask a question, but I'm going to read the question into this. And the question is sort of, what the hell am I supposed to do about that, Sven? Fucking know-it-all doofus. I mean, not you, Kay. Um, And Kay says, asking my partner to change. In response, empty promises or it's my personality. If you don't like it, leave. Okay. Um, So the promises are empty. So that's an indicator of what? That he's made promises in the past and uh, broken the promises, not kept them. So then you're left with, um, it's his personality. If you don't like it, leave. And forgive me for asking the obvious question, Kay. And I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything, but why not leave? He, he is flat out stating, I am not interested in changing. Take it or leave it. I don't give a shit. He's saying, I don't care enough about you to change. You're wanting change because it doesn't feel good. Obviously, why do we want change? Because something doesn't work for me, right? And he's saying, I don't care. And it sounds like he's said this before. So you've got a pattern now of him telling you flat out, I'm not going to change. And that is so fucking hard to hear, whether we hear it from a lover or a friend or a parent or a child or a boss or a coworker, to hear someone say, I don't, basically what they're saying, the message under the message, the underlying message is, I don't care enough about you to change who I am. What they're basically saying is, fuck you. Every time he says that, just imagine him putting up two middle fingers and saying, fuck you, because that is exactly what he's doing. And then the question becomes, if you were my client, I would ask you the very hard question. So why are you staying? What's the real fear driving the behavior, Kay? You're terrified of something. And I'm betting terrified of being alone, terrified of going through the fucking process of ending the relationship, uh, terrified. And we hit on all these earlier, terrified of the messages that come up you when inside of you when you're alone, terrified of being judged, all those terrors. But something is keeping you in it because he's flat out saying, I ain't changing. Yet you don't want to believe it. You're terrified of uh, the implications of that for your life. All right. Ginger30 asks the question, will the extreme taker realize his dickheadedness? <laughs> now there's a badass counseling follower if I ever heard one. Uh, will an extreme taker or what plenty of people call narcissists, will they realize their dickheadedness? Sometimes, yes. So, well, then that, not always. Or, well, let me put it this way. Inside of them, they know they're being a dickhead. They do. Um, which makes it even more malicious, doesn't it? They know they're hurting you. They know they're taking advantage of people, and they're doing it anyway because there is an override in them. And the override is, I don't care. All I care about is me. Getting my wants met that you all every all of you little people exist to meet my wants and needs unless you're somebody who stands up to me you know then i'll fucking bend over you know you'll because there's always somebody in their lives that they don't act that way towards always even if it's uh, you know even if they're the boss of the company they're not acting that way to work customers 
or maybe it's their mother they don't have. But there are people in their life that they do change their behaviors for. But back to the question, will the extreme taker realize his dickheadedness? Like realize, realize it. And I assume you mean and I verbalize it and apologize and so on and so forth. But let's just start with realize. Will they realize that they're being a dick? Yes, uh, sometimes. Uh, if and only if there is pain. The only thing that brings an extreme taker to realize uh, that they're being it and to have the potential of changing them is pain. And pain can come in very different forms. It's the form, uh, maybe it's a certain person they don't want to lose leaving them, which means that if you leave them and they don't realize their dickheadedness, then you're not that person and that hurts. But there is someone in their life or there will be that they don't want to lose. And if they act this way towards them, they will lose that person. And very often that's the come to Jesus moment. March 23rd of last year, we had an episode of the show, of the po podcast. You can go back and, and check it out. And it's uh, we had a, a narcissist, a self-proclaimed narcissist, not clinically diagnosed, but a self-proclaimed, you know, for all intents and purposes type narcissist. And we had someone recovering from being with a narcissist. These two people didn't know each other. It was a powerful episode. And that particular person said, the narcissist said, you know, I've been this way since I was fucking eight years old. And the only reason I'm sort of turning around now is because my wife, who I love so much, is going to leave me and she's going to take the kids and I'm just terrified. I don't want to lose her and I'm, I finally want to change. Now, I, we haven't had follow-up with him since then, but the bottom line is could have been bullshit, whatever, but, you know, I got to play the ball as it lies. But he was contrite and he was wanting to fucking change. Why? Pain. Pain can be financial. Pain can be fear of, you know, the world falling apart on you or, you know, people's criticism or with a pain that very often will get even the most hardened of narcissists or hardened of extreme taker. It's when your own kid doesn't want you. Now that kid may be your teenage daughter who just refuses to have anything to do with you and calls you out on your shit. Or maybe it's your son and your son is in his thirties and, uh, you know, now he has a wife and kids of his own. He doesn't want you anywhere near his kids. You know, it's cats in the cradle, right? Harry Chapin. Fuck you, old man, basically. I got my own life now, and you're such a dick. I don't want you near me. I don't want you near my wife, and I don't want you near my fucking kids. And But very often, it's pain. In fact, 99.99 .99 times out of 100, it's only pain that has the power to break an extreme taker. You know, that was a year ago, that episode with uh, Dustin? A year? A year ago. Jeez. That was a hell of an episode. We're easily one of our top three most powerful episodes. All right. This is one we have not been asked before. What is true happiness? <laughs> well, first of all, it's going to be different from for people, different people. However, in sort of a on sort of a wider scope, I believe that everyone has purposes, pursuits, um, people in their lives that make them feel good. That and by feel good, I mean that give them energy, that breathe life into them. And so, I believe that true happiness is a few things. One, it's where you have breath of life just breathe into you. You just exist differently. You have energy poured into you in part because you've gotten all the crud out of you. You're not being dragged down from inside. You don't have all of that internal anxiety and unrest. The motor isn't constantly going. That's what it is to have peace. It's not that there's peace around you. It's that in you there's peace because you've gotten out all the elements that have been corrupting you and dri driving you to live in fear. That's what that, that, that motor constantly going is fear. Constant fears, fears of going broke, fears of not being loved, fears of being alone, fears of whatever it might be, uh, death, medical issues, whatever it might be. And the more we get those out and do the work on those, we begin to have peace inside, calm. So that's part of it. The other part of it is that you're engaged in a life that breathes life into you. For those of you that are religious, um, at least on the you know Judeo-Christian side, there's that story in the uh, in Genesis of um, the Jewish Bible, and Christians have co-opted that. Um, and uh, it's the story of God. Whether you believe in God or not, it's a hell of a metaphor. So just play along for a minute. Um, where God craft forms the clay, right, and the clay in the shape of what we know now as a person, right. And God then the the clay has no life. God does what? breathes the breath of life into the clay's nostrils and it is animated. It has life. And I began to think about that when I was in my 30s. I was trying to figure out the path for my life. You know, what's the right way? You think the light and the dark and shit like none of that was working. And then I thought about that story 
and one or two others, and I realized that's what it is. That happiness is really about what breathes life into me. Not physical air. I know my lungs breathe life into me uh, and the heart that pumps the lungs. I mean, what gives me energy? What makes me feel, and I love this word, and I, I stole this from uh, the author Shakti Gawain, who was sort of a new agey author in the late 80s, and she wrote a book, several books, uh, Creative Visualization, but the one that really hits it out of the park for me, and I actually recommend it in my book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup, because it's one of my Bibles. It's her book, Living in the Light. And she talks, she uses a word she calls aliveness. She says, what we're all really seeking is aliveness. I love that word. I love that. In fact, you, if you've read my stuff, you've seen me use that word, and I usually put it in all caps. I think true happiness is that peace inside that passes all understanding beyond, beyond rational comprehension, beyond our own brain's ability to get us there. It's a sense of peace, a sense of calm inside, one that perdures, one that lasts, not just peace in the moment. And it's not always, oh, every moment I'm calm and I'm a fucking Buddhist monk every moment of my day. No. It's just that, that, it, that there's still waters deep down, still waters. Um, and then there's, a, there's something that animates me. That I have people around me that I give life to and who give life to me and, uh, and that I have a, a purpose for which to live. Uh, I like the book. There was a very, 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 very popular book, uh, international bestseller, um, a couple of them by this author, Rabbi Harold Kushner back in the 90s. And uh, really a great writer and a great thinker, a deep thinker. And Kushner, he actually did a bit of a, a one book riff on uh, the notion of um, uh, when all I've ever wanted isn't, when all you've ever wanted isn't enough. I believe that was the one and he talks about, and he's basing it on some of uh, you know Hebrew scripture. But what he talks about is really, it boils down to good food, good drink, good work, and good people. And boy, you think about it, that's that's pretty fucking good right there. I mean, you know, that pretty much sums up a lot of life. Um, but the truth is, uh, w you ask, what is true happiness? For every person, it's going to be different. But I think it really comes from, ultimately, everything boils down to peace inside and a sense of purpose. And, and then the happy things, like sunsets and like the ocean and like, you know, for me, it's bike rides and workouts and time alone in my woods. You all know I have woods on my property um, and so forth. So, but it's, and the ultimate thing that stands between us and our own definition of true happiness is always, always, always all the pain, the fears, and the bullshit messages you've been taught about yourself that are in you, stuck in you, and you are driving. You are living a life on someone else's drumbeat. And until you get those voices out of you, you're going to keep living on their drumbeat and you are going to be fucking miserable. Get those out and you begin to hear the... The quiet thump, thump, thump of your own source, your own inner voice. All right, next question. Rob, you got an itch? Um, I have a question. It's sort of the same thing. Lay it on me. All right. I struggle being vulnerable due to past traumas, and I fear it is what makes me so unloved and lonely, even though people are around me that say they care. Any advice for me? And it, the opening sentence was fear of being vulnerable, right? I struggle being vulnerable right. due to past trauma. Right, of course. And and so, you, I mean, you've just laid out your roadmap for how to fix that one. And the way you fix that one is by going back into those memories, those past traumas, you call them, which are memories with emotional charges attached to them. Like when I think about, uh, my girlfriend got in a, a fender bender car accident when there was a winter storm out here in the New York City area about a month and a half ago. And it was fender bender, slid right through the intersection. Everybody was sliding through the intersection. And the person ahead of her was kind of a dick about it. Um, this woman comes out and she's shouting, you hit me. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, no shit, lady, we're on ice. Um, but anyway, um, and so we just got a storm in the New York City area in the last 24 hours. And my girlfriend's like, I'm not fucking driving in that shit. Not after what happened a month and a half ago. All right. So she has a memory of her little car accident. And I don't mean to be condescending. Oh, your cute little car accident. But it was little. Compared to real car accidents, it was little and nobody got hurt. The point is she has a memory that has an emotional charge. And the emotional charge is shock. Um, a little bit of fear when she was in that moment, a little bit of sadness, and a little bit of anger at that woman. Now, she has not fully decharged that memory. By her own admission, she has not fully decharged 
In other words, gone inside, flushed out, journaled out, written letters out, and talked it out with me, with her therapist, whatever, all the feelings surrounding that memory. So she has a memory that still has an emotional charge. So when people talk about, oh, I get triggered whenever I'm around Gus, well, there's something about Gus. Gus isn't what's triggering you per se. The Gus is engaging in something, doing something, saying something that drops into your love cup and it's electrifying those emotional charges on those memories that you have that have emotional charges attached to them, okay? So if my girlfriend were to sit down and with her therapist or journaling or whatever and talk about those emotions and get them all out, then she would just have a memory that no longer has any emotional charges attached to it. Okay, so when this uh, particular listener asks the question, basically, you know, I'm for afraid of being vulnerable in relationships and it's not just love relationships, it sounds like it's friendships as well because she says, you know, I've got people around me who say they love me, but it's almost like I don't fucking believe them. Okay, when you say that it, because of past pains, I'm basically afraid to open up again. You're saying that those past pains, those past relationships, there are memories that you have that have emotional charges attached to them. They are still charged. It's like you've got a bunch of sticks of fucking dynamite inside of you. And so you avoid any situation that looks like a match or a lighter that would light the fuse of that. And what would light that most powerfully for you, as you see it, is if I were to be vulnerable again, because guess what might happen? I might get hurt again, right? And that's what keeps everyone, that's what keeps us closed down, which is why when I'm, when I, why I talk about it in the book, uh, there's a hole in my love cup. I talk about the difference between brutal honesty and radical honesty. Brutal honesty is just the person that goes around saying, this is what's wrong with you, this is what's wrong with you, this is what's wrong with you. It's like, oh, wow, that's a gift. Fuck you. That's, that's easy. Harder is radical honesty, where you go inside and you say, this is who I am. This is what's wrong with me, or this is what I struggle with, or these are my fears, or these are my aspirations. Radical honesty is radical because I'm revealing me, and that's the scary fucking part, and that's precisely the point you're making. I'm afraid to be vulnerable, Spence. What the fuck should I do about it? What the fuck you should do about it is go into those memories and begin, and the choir sang, journal about it, write letters about it, talk to your therapist about it. You have to go into those memories and begin to feel and release those emotional charges. And in my book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup, I teach other tools, some of which are even faster than the journaling and letter writing, for decharging those memories. That's any memory that you have in your past. Any anxiety or fear that you're experiencing in your present, there is a memory inside of that that has an emotional charge. Every single question today that has to do with um, how do I let go of the pain? How do I let go of that person? Why do I still have anxiety over? I'm afraid of. All of those are about some memories in your past that have emotional charges, all of them. And or additionally, there's the aspect of the bullshit beliefs you've been taught about yourself, which is even more damaging than those emotionally charged memories. Oh, here we go. This is a good question. Thanks, Thomas. This is a good question. What area of the healing journey are you exploring now, Sven? What's a big revelation since Love Cup? Well, it's funny you say that. <laughs> I'm actually working on the next book. Well, I just finished the last book that was after Love Cup, and that's Badass Wisdom, all right? And that's the 366-day 366 uh, um, meditational, inspirational book. So that one. Um, but I've got, I'm working on the sequel, the actual sequel to Love Cup. And it's funny you ask that question, Thomas, because... <laughs> Um, you know, I write every morning and I was up bright and early this morning at four or whatever to write. I'm like, I have, there is so much more new material since Love Cup, which came out in 2018, but it didn't really hit until, or become popular until 2021 and 22. There is so much new fucking material. It's like, holy shit, how many, um, and, and so you ask the question, what area of the healing journey are you exploring now? The area of the healing journey that I'm exploring now is really my, how my counseling has changed of other people and how much I, the, it's like the velocity, the acceleration of how much I'm learning from people, nuances that I'd never seen before. The more you go into more shit with more people, the more nuances you see. So I'm gonna give you one example. The last uh, woman, the last question I just answered was about vulnerability. And you guys have heard me mention this particular insight. I had a client and this client, very successful woman, owned a business and so forth, and uh, you know worked hard and all that, had uh, teenage kids. And after we had worked together for a few months, uh, she took a couple months off, and then she came back for a, sort of a tune-up session. And I, you know, how are you going? How are you doing? What's the latest going on with you, et cetera, et cetera. And she makes the comment, Sven, what I've noticed in my life is I am more vulnerable 
but I feel less vulnerable. And I'm like, wow, that is one of the most brilliant sentences, pithy, clear, and powerful sentences that I've ever heard a client say. No, I had never heard someone even remotely touch that in my 30 years of counseling. And this one, she said, I am more vulnerable. In other words, I'm opening up more than I ever have. Revealing my radically honest self, just revealing myself. But I feel, even though I'm giving and showing more, I feel less vulnerable, not more, less vulnerable. That's someone who's done the work, baby. That's someone who gets it. That's someone who dove in. And she, and she was a fucking like rabid disciple of this work rabid learner and doing the work. And she was in session with me every fucking week. We're banging this shit out, going deeper, deeper, deeper. So I'm more vulnerable, but I feel less vulnerable. So the, the area of he, the healing process and the growth process that I'm in is I've always, you know, had the counseling practice in most of my adult life. But as, you know, I've moved into, especially my 50s, I've changed as a therapist and I've become more aggressive in, in a loving context and, and so forth. And people, my clients know they're loved, but I've become more aggressive, not towards them, but towards the demons that are inside of them, the voices that are inside of them. Uh, and, all, and just going after that shit. And I don't, I just don't fuck around anymore. But, and that obviously requires a lot of trust. They have to trust that I'm not there to hurt them. I'm there to reach down their fucking throat and pull out those dragons and slay the fuck out of their dragons. Um, but as far as me personally, um, I think the biggest one, I had never fucking done this before. In all the decades that I, you know, I started lifting when I was 11. When I started lifting weights, you know, heavy lifting and competing and stuff, Arnold Schwarzenegger was still competing in bodybuilding, all right? I go way back to the fucking 70s. I had my first lift when I was 11 and I'm 56 now. So I've been working out for 45 years. I've been journaling since I was 13. So just a couple of years after I started working out, but I had never put, two and fucking two together. That's how fucking dumb I am. And it was about, I don't know, I want to say five years ago. And because it was uh, before COVID and uh, I'm at the gym and I'm like, I was just pissed about something. And I grab a piece of paper because I always have my notebook with me because I can chart my numbers, you know? Um, and I get it, I start fucking journaling and then I'm getting more worked up and, it, and I'm doing it in between sets, right? So then I get I get in there, you know, get in the squat rack or get on the fucking, maybe I'm doing shrugs or whatever the fuck I'm doing. And I'm just crushing the fucking weight, man. It was a monster workout. And at the end, I felt emotionally flushed as well in a good way. And I'm like, why the hell have I not been doing this sooner? So one of the insights in my own, not really healing journey, but aliveness journey is pairing journaling and heavy lifting. It's the fucking greatest. It's just like, because you can bring up any sad rage-filled fucking anxiety, depression, anything when you're working out. Uh, depression's a little trickier one, uh, but at least the, you know, the big energizing sort of ones. And I'm journaling about it and you do your sets, journal sets, journal sets. And it's like, oh, dang, in 45 years, how come I never thought of this sooner? So anyway, good question. All right, what's next? Okay, let's play with this one a little bit. This is from Adrienne. Why would my ex-husband marry a woman with the same name as mine, live in the house that we lived in, and name their dog the same as ours was? Wow. Wow. That's an ex-husband with lack of imagination. Living in the same house that you guys lived in, I mean, that could be just chalked up to convenience. Hey, he's too fucking lazy to get a new house. Or it's like, well, I sell a house, especially in this market with interest rates being high or whatever. I'm not going to sell, a, you know, buy a new house, whatever. Um, but then you pair it with, you know, her having the same name. Okay, you could almost pass that one off. But then they have a dog with the same name as yours. Now it's Now we're into Weirdville, okay? And if I'm really honest, what... My thought is, is that he really liked certain aspects about you, but he he wanted to recreate the life you guys had, but tweak it with someone with a different whatever. I don't know, personality, look, something. And, uh, but, you know, it's not like he did it to spite you. That's a hell of a price to pay to spite another person. But he's trying to recreate his life or keep continuity with what he had, but do it with somebody else. All right, I'm gonna take one more, maybe maybe two. You know, this is, okay, I'm gonna bring this one up. This is the last question of the day. And it's from Sean. And he 
puts a question mark at the end. So he's obviously asking a question. He says, how about becoming more self-aware through accountability? Through accountability, implying that self-awareness is the goal and accountability can get you there. It's really funny because this came up twice in counseling uh, sessions this last week where I had um, one male, one female client talking about I need to be more accountable in my life. And and how they've struggled to be accountable uh, to themselves, to the ones they love, accountable to the person, to the woman I really want to be, Sven. I'm not being accountable to that. And so what Sean is proposing here, how about becoming more self-aware through accountability? And I would actually invert that equation, Sean. I would say you become more accountable to your authentic self by becoming more self-aware. See, if someone's not being accountable, if someone's, which implies inconsistent, right? that I, I have this aspiration to be and act these certain ways, and I hit it sometimes, but I fail. I hit it and I fail, I hit it and I fail. So there's inconsistencies. And if someone is living inconsistently in their life, it's because I, and from where I sit, generally speaking, if they're being inconsistent, it's because who they're trying to be isn't who they really are. Those things that they're trying to be accountable to either aren't who they really are or they've got shit going on inside of them that is holding them back from being accountable. So by becoming more self-aware, and that means going inside and finding what those messages are that are inside of them, by going and identifying those messages and extracting those messages and going through the work of seeing where they came from and what the implications are of the fact that they've been running your life the whole time, the more you get those out, the more you're able you are to be accountable to this person that you inherently are and aspire to be the best version of. I actually spend like three different chapters in, there's a hole in my love cup, talking about messaging and the messaging we receive when we're children and the hidden messages, the underlying messages that become the drivers, the virus infecting the operating system of our our whole lives. And those messages, once we can identify those and get those out, what's left underneath that is our own authentic self underneath all of the crud. And uh, your authentic self effortlessly blossoms up like tulips in springtime. They just effortlessly come through. But it's always about that. So the accountability, you'll become more accountable to who you really are. You'll be able to because you're not being dragged down by that which is not you. All right. Now, this will be, in fact, the very final question. And the question is this. All right. Weird question. But do you keep all your journals? And this is actually a very relevant question because I get a lot of people saying, you know, what do I do with the journals? Should I keep them? You know, or I used to keep a journal span and I stopped keeping it because it got used against me. I had that happen once that uh, one of my exes gave my journals that they had found to my other ex and it got used against me, uh, blah, 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 just ugly shit, right? Um, I kept my journals for, I'm gonna say 15 years from let's say 13 to 28-ish, 15, 13 to 30, I had stacks and stacks of spiral spiral notebooks, uh, three ring notebooks, cocktail napkins. I journaled on everything, right? I had probably had clothes that I had written on as well. I used to write on the back of my hand like a journaling question that I wanted to come back to later when I wasn't on my bike or something like that. And you know what I did? Honestly, I, I was at my parents. I visited my parents and I had boxes of them up in the attic and I started a big old bonfire out back and I burned all my old journals because I knew I wasn't going to fucking read through them. I'm not, I was never the person and everybody's different. So I'm not advocating this for anybody else. It doesn't matter, whatever works for you. Um, but uh, I was never a person that went back and read my own journals. That didn't really do anything for me. Um, for me, it was the flushing process. Very rarely would I ever go back and read them. But some people love to go back and read them. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's fantastic. If you get something out of it, hey, God bless you, go for it. Um, so I burned them all. And then I'd accumulate, you know, a few over the course of, you know, a year or two, and I'd, you know, have them shredded or burn them or let them go. And the only reason was because for a lot of my years, especially my 30s, um, I was traveling light through life. You know, I was, I had spent uh, time uh, ministering to the homeless, living in my car, ministering to homeless car people. And then I had done some years um, ministering to the homeless of Oakland, California, living on the street, sleeping on concrete every night. And so, you know, carrying around fucking journals is just dumb. Uh, when you're living on the street, I, I, for me at least, it's like, why would I want that extra weight? Um, but some people do keep them and there's nothing wrong with that. Or you want to keep them, keep them. What do I do with them? I just let them go. So if I'm at the gym and I'm journaling between sets, I'll tear that bad boy up and I'll flush it down the toilet or I'll take it with me and just stick it in the fireplace at home. 
Okay. Uh, but some people, it's, it's totally optional up to you. But remember, the goal of journaling, as a, in terms of the healing process, the goal of journaling, you can journal for whatever the hell reason you want, right? But in terms of the healing process, the goal is to flush out. And if you want to keep those, you can, but the goal is just keep getting it out. All right. Well, it's been great having everyone here on the show. My name is Sven Erlinson. We're not sure why, but my parents might have been drinking that day or had a hell of a sense of humor, or I gave mom a lot of pain during childbirth. But yes, my name is Sven Erlinson. I'm sitting across from KC over there in the booth and Rob next to me. Rob, any closing thoughts on today's show? I thought they were interesting questions all, and it's a lot of people have the same issue. Perfect. And you know what? The repetition really does help, I think. You know, and you know what's interesting about that, Rob, before we close it out? Um, we've been, a, as far as just mindless TV, we've been watching this show, Cheaters, that's on. Uh, no, Catfishing, Catfishers, that's the one. And I'm like, it's it's a funny little show, but it's like, why do we keep watching? It's the same thing over and over again. Well, because it's intriguing. So presumably the same thing over and over again applied to different situations can be intriguing. So there's hope for us, Rob. There's hope. I think there's more than hope. Uh, God bless you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, from Belgrade to uh, Bulgaria, from, that's not a big leap, is it? I was looking for something else that started with a B, from Belgrade to Bayview, Washington, uh, and South America to New Zealand. It's been great having you here on the show. I've had a lot of fun, and I you're probably ready to go nuts, but on behalf of the entire team, have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day. Hey.